Welcome back, everybody. You guys are listening to the Down to the Wire podcast. I'm your host, Brian Costa, and we got a great show for you guys tonight. Unfortunately, Tyler is out, but I am, but I am, you know, re- really happy to welcome in a special guest tonight. Uh, he hasn't been on the show in quite a while. I think the last time he was on was maybe our quarantine special, you know, very close to a year ago now at this point. It's been way too long, but uh, without any further ado, please welcome to the show my personal friend, John Warren. Welcome to the show, John. Hi, Brian. Thank you for having me. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm uh, ready to get down to the wire. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, you know, John, for anyone who doesn't know about you, uh, you know, maybe kind of tell some people, you know, like, you know, like, you know, obviously where you're from, you know, where you go to school and kind of some stuff like that. All right. So um, my name uh John Warren. Uh, I go to Mass Maritime down on the Cape. I'm a sophomore and I'm having a Bachelor of Science, science in uh, Energy Systems Engineering. There we go. And I also play uh, football and I run track down at the academy. That's awesome. So, you know, you know, you know, it's really good to have people on the show who kind of are athletes at, you know, at the next level. Unfortunately, my my athletic career did end in high school. I didn't get to have that opportunity going forward into college and just getting, kind of getting people on the show who do kind of have that experience, you know, at whatever level. It's, you know, awesome to have. And, you know, for it to be, you know, with one of my friends, it's a great thing to have. Uh, But, you know, uh, one of the reasons we did want to get you on the show tonight and was because of a very specific story that kind of in that kind of entailed you a little more than me, but we were both uh, kind of entwined into the story. So uh, for anyone who doesn't know, me and John both work as flag football referees in a youth flag football league uh, down, you know, a couple, you know, maybe, you know, like 10, 15 minutes from our houses. So we've been doing we've we played in this league you've played in and you played in it for a couple years you know longer than me i played in it for about four years and i've refed in it now for you know after the conclusion this year it's been about five so i've refed in this league for a good bit of time and i played in it too and it's fair to say that you know on the field and you know on the sidelines we've encountered our fair share of crazy coaches that'd be that'd be very very fair to say i agree yeah I mean, you know, I, I'll say it though, you know, we've, we've seen some great coaches, some, some people who, you know, they just get it. It's flag football. Like, let's not go crazy here. I mean, you know, the, there are some coaches like they just understand like, Hey, this is a, this is not like the end all be all, but then there are some coaches who really take it to the next extreme. And for the most part, the weird thing that, you know, a lot of people wouldn't expect is that, you know, the higher up levels, which, you know, the highest level in this league is U14 it at that level, those coaches actually really seem to kind of just be very laid back and chill. Obviously, you know, there's, there, there's some kind of ever here and there where they're a little crazy, but for the most part, you know, most coaches at that level and even 12, you are kind of normal for whatever reason it's at the like eight, U level and the 10, U level that the coaching seems to get very extreme and they seem to, you know, take, and they seem to take, you know, losses and all this stuff very personally to them as to them as people. And I don't know if it's because, you know, the kids are younger and they haven't had that experience of just saying like, oh, this is just a flag football league, or I don't know what it is, but uh, like, you've been able to, you've been able to kind of attest to this. I mean, we've seen some crazy coaches. I remember we had a, we had some, we had an, an obnoxious eight U coach one time that, you know, berated us because we didn't want to call blocking downfield when, when a, gr- when a group of teammates was going to celebrate a touchdown, we've had some, you know, coaches like grill us repeatedly, man. I mean, you know, you want to talk about your experience with some of these coaches before we get into the big story tonight? Yeah, I mean, there are some coaches that uh, take the game, I could say, very passionately. Yeah. And, uh, they're very proud about it, but uh, sometimes try to argue with the refs, as I get, you know, as a player. And um, I understand where they're coming from. I can see both sides of it, you know, being on both sides of the spectrum, yeah. being, um, you know, being a- playing, mm-hmm. you know, even in high school. Like, I get it. My coaches would scream. I had a couple coaches thrown out in high school arguing Jesus. with the refs. And, I mean, I understand the aspect, but then again, it's a flag football league and it's yeah. not competitive, no playoffs, no, no anything crazy, yeah. no winnings, more just for pride. So, yeah, I mean, it, I mean, like, you know, in the past we've had playoff runs, but this year, this year, like you, you actually kind of hit it on the head. There was no playoffs just due to COVID. They try to basically get all the kids in and out as quick as possible. So like, you know, I thought that this year it was going to be, you know, more, you know, relatively calm because they were like, well, not, we're not competing for even a plastic trophy at the end of the year. Like, there's nothing really worth competing for. Uh, but then, but, and, you know, I'll actually kind of say, I don't know about your opinion, but, you know, up until this event, would you say it was kind of a, you know, calmer year in general? Yeah. I mean, honestly, we had, uh, it was like our COVID season. We only had like, usually have like 12 games now. Eight, I think. 12, eight. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. And uh, that's without playoffs, all that. And 
um this year we only had six and it was uh kind of like our covid year you could say yeah uh, very relaxed a lot of coaches you know you're bringing kids in from your local town it's nothing crazy not really like too competitive like the uh age differentials like were d- crazy this year but at the end of the day, day you're just trying to have the kids out there playing yeah all right yeah, I mean, it was a very relaxed year as compared to prior years that uh, me and Brian have uh, mm-hmm. both witnessed. Yeah. So, I mean, it kind of went like that for a long time. And I, I was kind of saying this to myself, kind of going to the last game. I was like, it's like, you know what? Most of these coaches actually kind of, you know, were able to kind of handle themselves this year. It was, it was I, I was actually kind of impressed, you know, even some coaches in the past who I've, who I've kind of, we've kind of had some interactions with kind of realized they kind of threw up their hands and they were like, listen, we're just glad to be here, you know, so we'll take it. And this kind of leads us into the into the interaction that we had this past Sunday. And this was the reason I actually wanted to get you on the show for the most part, for the most part, because I really wanted to talk with you about this. So we're on Sunday and it's the first game of the day. You know, we're we start at 9 a.m. We, we go from nine to three and we're doing this thing. And, you know, you know, coaches, all, you know, you know, even though we said it was a calm year, coaches will still get chippy about some calls and they'll be like, oh, are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? And I get it. You know, you did you know, if a ref makes a if, if a ref if a ref makes a call you don't like, you're gonna question it. Like it it sucks, but that's just what that's part of part the, of the game. Part of, it's part, part of, of the game. gig, exactly. So, you know, we had some you know we had some coaches do that, and you know some of them they actually understand the rules of the league. There are some you know very specific rules within our, within our flag football league where it's not exactly football. Like you know we have a seven second rule that for anyone who is kind of wondering what that is, it's almost like an eight second violation in basketball where you have to get the ball you know past the past the backcourt. Otherwise, it's a turnover to the other team. In our league, we have a seven-second rule that where if it a where if the quarterback doesn't hand it off and you know decides to stand back in the pocket after seven seconds, you blow the play dead. It's an incomplete pass. That's just a way we speed up the game so that way guys can't stand back there for like minutes at a time holding the ball and waiting for something to happen. Yeah, mostly yeah. due to the fact that we don't really have a pass rush. There's no offensive defensive line in flag football. Yeah, that goes that goes for it also in like seven on sevens. It's the same way in actual football. There's always a seven second rule in order to get the ball off because let's face it. Like you can't be just running around as a defensive back, even like a linebacker, I guess you could say just waiting for the pass to get off because there is a set amount of time. Mm -hmm. So, So, you know, uh, yeah. yeah, And I agree with you. Like there are, you know, there are these different rules, you know, to kind of, you know, just, you know, simulate what, uh, simulate what an actual pass rush would be like and have it be more realistic to the game. So, I mean, we were, and you know, some coaches actually know these rules, but some of them, you know, they're coming from maybe, you know, just like peewee football backgrounds or like, you know, even just, you know, maybe middle school or high school football backgrounds, whereas where this rule, you know, isn't as implemented game wise it is as it is practice wise. And they and, you know, for us being in the league, you know, you've probably been in it, you know, more than 10 years, you know, with playing and coaching. I've been in, I think, maybe nine or nine or eight you know, with my experience combined. We kind of know the ins and outs of the league. It's like you can't jump. You can't leave the ground. Otherwise, you're down like these different like, you know, idiosyncrasies and plays within the game. So I remember you kind of got like uh, you ended up calling a seven second, uh, you know, call and whistle and whistle to play dead for a whistle to play dead for a kid. And this coach for this coach for a team, I'm not going to name. I don't want to dox anybody, but he kind of just comes at you and, and, and literally says like and basically, you know, kind of questioned your authority on it. You know, like what was your like, I don't want I mean, let's try to you know keep it a little clean. But uh, how did he kind of in, how did he kind of approach you with that? Yeah, so I mean, I agree with you. Let's not try to dox anyone. We're all professionals <laughs> around here, and um, yeah. So I mean, he went after me. He was like, "What the heck?" And I was like, "Well, honestly, I always call him coach. I'm like, coach, like, just uh, player held on to the ball for seven seconds. He's like, seven seconds. Never heard that in my life. And it's like, you know, yeah. man, this is actually the last game of the season. Uh, you, you know, yeah. we, we thought you would have, you know, maybe come across this by now. But for him, he just didn't he just didn't hear. It. And he actually I don't even think he believed you when you made the penalty. He thought you were making that stuff up pretty much. Yeah, he thought I was attacking his team, which unfortunately, um, uh, some of the players on his team were a little too chippy. Um, and that happens. I mean, I get it. But uh, yeah, I used to be, you know, I was probably that player that was a little. Too, uh, <laughs> yeah because due to uh regular football but at the end of the day you try to protect the kids especially after what uh me and brian have seen we're not going to mention any names or any like players or anything but it can turn with especially younger kids into a very very serious game so i completely understand like you know the reasoning behind the rules and everything now 
also after seeing it firsthand a couple of times, uh, Brian, you can attest to that. I remember last season, the season before, there was a couple of instances where uh, even kids were t- getting taken out, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. like seriously getting rushed to the hospital. So, yeah, I mean, I remember one kid. I mean, I remember one kid. I mean, I don't know the kid's name, so I'm not going to, you know, this isn't anything on him. I remember, you know, because kids were so, you know, competitive about it, this one kid got tackled and they tackled by the shoestrings and it li- he literally catapulted in the boards like head first. And it was like this really awful thing. And I was like, oh my God. And so, you so, you know, you mean like there are reasons why there are these protective rules in places and in, in place. And, you know, I don't like a ref, you know, you know, being, being the end all being all game. I like to see the players play in a game. So, you know, that's where I come from with that. Uh, but you know, you do, but these are, you know, littler kids. So you do need to, you know, ha- you do need to sometimes enforce rules to protect them for their safety. So that is always something that you have to look out for. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And then um, basically just getting back to the story. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, the coach uh, pretty much was, um, you could say like uh, kind of making a scene out of it. His team was down by, oh, yeah. uh, I'd say like two or three scores by this point. Yeah. And, it, and it's, and it's, and the game is winding down. The game's winding down. He's like, just let the kids play. He was just trying to make a scene about it, um, parading across the field and everything. And oh, yeah. I was just, I was just, you know, as a, from a player standpoint, my coach is doing that on the field. I would honestly just feel embarrassed. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I felt, I felt, that, you know, that, that's kind of how I felt. Because there's before. sometimes where it's like as a coach and, you know, as an adult, you kind of just have to step up and suck it up. Yeah. I know. Uh, I'm a young adult. I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Like no anything but you know <laughs> just as a player standpoint that's how i would see it and uh, it was very unprofessional of him and then him and his assistant coach uh proceeded to kind of go after me for the end of the game didn't really yeah. set the game kind of yeah. used a little bit of uh um some I, words i, that, I, I can uh, i can get into a little bit of that too but, so, i mean yeah no so yeah I think very like, very violent yeah it got a little it got a little chippy towards the end of the game with with them I mean, you know, I, I, I feel bad for, you know, you know, I know you did come out, come up to me and, and, and you were like, Hey, what should we do about this guy? And, and I'm, and I was kind of just like, you know, me and you, like we've, we've experienced coaches that, you know, in terms of getting belligerent on a field, we've seen much worse. I remember seeing a U8, you know, c- cuss a guy out and, you know, he had to get tossed from a game. And I was like, man, that was intense. So like, I've seen like, you know, coaches get more animated on a field and, you know, maybe I didn't realize kind of the situation at the time. And I was like, I was like, you know, this guy, this guy is kind of a, this guy's kind of a donkey. So we'll let, you know, he can stay in the game, but you know, if it, things get a little worse, he can, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of look at that going forward. So, you know, it gets to the end of the game and he's walking off the field. I'm just walking out, out, out of the field to, you know, maybe grab something from go grab something from our manager's office and kind of do some stuff like that. And I'm walking out and I kind of just like, see, see the guy, see the coach. And I kind of just say, and I kind of just say to him, I'm like, and I was just like, and I basically said, Hey man, like, like, like it was a great coach and you guys this year, you know, have a good one. And then he proceeds to say to me, so you ended up showing, showing up a little bit late to work. I've done the same. It's just the way the schedule works. You know, it didn't, yeah, it didn't I, had to, I had some family issues going on. So I yeah. had to take care of that real quick. No. Yeah. It's I'm literally around in our driveway, just trying to get out. Yeah. And again, it's literally just, you know, like, Life. you know, it, it wasn't like you were an hour late. You were literally like, like just running a couple of minutes behind. Like that's not like I I've done that. I've done that plenty of times. You've seen me show up like, you know, as it's getting, as it's getting, getting a little close to action time and you know, it happens to the, happens to the best of us. So I'm walking off the field and I go up to this coach. I'm, I'm kind of just like, you know, just having a little jargon back and forth. And I'm a little small talk, just like, just like, all right, I'll see you guys next year. Hopefully you guys have a, you know, hopefully, you know, wish you guys the best of luck going forward. And he goes to me and he goes, and he goes, so man, I know why, uh, no way you're the ref was late today. And I was like, Oh yeah. Why is that? And he goes, Oh, you know? And I was like, no, what? And he goes, Oh no, you know? And I was like, actually, no, man, I think you actually need to explain to me what you're talking about. And he, and he goes, and he goes, I think he needs to go get tested. And I'm, and I was like, wait, did John tell, did John tell you he needed to get like a COVID test or something? And so, I, so like, I, I, I was like, wait, did you go to get COVID tested? And I was like, no, he didn't go to get COVID tested. So I'm like, wait, tested for what? And he goes, and he tells me, Oh, he's basically high as a kite. <laughs> and I was like, whoa <laughs> and i i literally looked at him and i i had i just had a moment of honesty and i was like dude this is a u10 coach and i'm like dude what the heck is wrong with you and i used a little more kind of colorful language to kind of to kind of take uh, exhibit my point and he, and he goes and i and he basically goes he is and i'm just like you know john for your experience you you, you said it earlier before you play you play you know you play football at a military academy like i i don't think there were that there would be anyone you know 
more stringent of being drug tested than you. I mean, you can probably attest to this. Yeah, I can. And unfortunately, um, he kind of just got caught up in the heat of the moment, which I understand. But then uh, it got just really unprofessional real quick. Very, very unprofessional real quick, I would say. I mean, you know, it's not even actual tackle football. You know, you're at you're at an indoor soccer facility just doing some, just doing your thing. And you have to, you know, make it a scene like that. I, I was just like, man, what are you doing? Like, that was ridiculous. And I, I was like, I was like, I was offended on your behalf. I was like, my God, you're going to treat him like this. That was ridiculous. I know. But it was crazy. It was a, it was an absolutely crazy day. You know, luckily that was kind of the only real fireworks we saw that day. There were some other, you know, instances, but you know, in terms of fireworks for a season that kind of, that kind of covered the bases there, but uh, in, but in, you know, now kind of getting into sports news, I wanted to, you know, cover, I wanted to, you know, go through that story with you. It was an absolutely crazy day that, you know, kind of to kind of cap off the season. Any final yeah. words for you on that? Um, I mean, it was a good season. It was successful. Yeah. And uh, we got everything we wanted to do across. Um, mm-hmm. Just unfortunately, at the way uh, the coach did at the end there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it is what it is. I understand his uh, frustration. But... Yeah, uh, I'm just you know to kind of control and talk, and yeah, a little sad, but you know it is what it is, and yeah, you know, you know, know actually, well, you, well, you may be sad. I think you can. I, I think you can. I hope you can find some happiness in knowing that you know of the mature one there. That's you. That that's you and us. That is not him by any means. He lost to that day, like not not even just on the field, but just as a person. Like that was just ridiculous by him. Uh, mm-hmm. but you know, kind of staying with football. I think it's only appropriate now that we go into the NFL after coming out of this, you know, after coming out of this youth league, I wanted to, you know, cover that story, but in football, you know, we're both, we're both diehard Patriots fans and there seems to be something brewing right now out in Irvine, California. There is a player's camp, basically it's almost like a captain's practice called Pat's West. I I mean, you, you've kind of been posting about this at like just as so much as I am. I mean, what are your thoughts on the fact that, you know, there, there are a bunch of these players and now Patriots of new and old, like guys that we just signed in free agency, and you know some and some you know more long term guys coming out there to California to practice after this seven and nine season. Um, I mean it shows dedication and it yeah. shows that really you know they're not really trying to have a repeat season of the seven and nine. And no. honestly, the Pats going seven and nine with that squad. If you look up like a week fourteen like team, what we had on yeah. defense, you mm-hmm. couldn't name a single player. Yeah, I'm saying like a single player on that team that was like even competitive. It just kind of goes to show that uh, Bill Belichick's coaching is, well, elite. Mm -hmm. And even going seven and nine as, you know, on paper, that might not look really impressive with the guys they had and the situations, you know, we were kind of dealt with. And the defense we actually did have, like you were saying, like his his coaching was impressive, but that's not because the defense didn't perform. We actually had a pretty decent defense at times, but it was the offense that really just could not pick up the slack. Yeah, and unfortunately, we couldn't really pick up the slack on offense uh, due to, you know, uh, Cam Newton just having a little bit of, you know. Troubles, to say the least. to say the least. And yeah. uh, the wide receiver core, you know, consisting of, uh, well, you know, Gunnar Ochescali, which I can't <laughs> blame him. He, uh, he was a pro baller this year. but oh, yeah. As a punt returner, though, unfortunately. It was, not as, it was not as a wide receiver because Cam only had 10 touchdowns here at the year. But, you know, I was looking at some of the guys that have attended so far. Uh, Jared Stidham and a bunch of guys have been putting out hype videos at this place, and it's actually really cool. It's not even just, you, you know, like, you know, training camp and stuff going on. It looks like they're also having some team bonding, so it looks like they're going, like, to a paintball course. It looks like they're actually trying to really bond as a team. And some of the guys that have shown up so far include Cam Newton, Jared Stidham, Jacoby Myers, Nikhil Harry, Matt Lacoste, Devin Asiasi, Hunter Henry, Nelson Aguilar is showing up, and Kendrick Bourne who's become a guy who I really have started to like, uh, I, I don't know why. I mean, he, you know, has kind of just always been like a third, you know, type receiver, but he is like, he kind of just has like a type of personality and kind of, and he's just bringing a, a type of atmosphere to this team that I really enjoy. You know, he just seems like some, he just seems like a really likable guy and, you know, having that up in new England, I mean, you know, you have plenty of likable guys up here, but I feel like someone with his kind of attitude and stuff towards the game, I'm really excited to see how he works up here. Yeah, I mean, honestly, he really fits the play scheme I think we're looking for, which honestly, mm-hmm. I see it as a play action type offense. Yeah. Um, you know, we're still going to be, it's going to be a run heavy, like 30 runs a game, you know, due to the fact that we have a 250 pound quarterback. Yeah. And run the ball and run over linebackers legitimately. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, I honestly think it's going to be more of a play action. And uh, he really gives us, you know, that, uh, that quickness to get off, uh, 
you know, the first like, you know, five, six yards right off the ball and then yeah. uh, you can get going into his route. Mm-hmm. And I'm just really excited. I love to see, you know, Cam Newton. Like, um, I really hope um, apparently his uh, arm has gotten a lot better. He's a great yeah. personality and everyone, despite his troubles, you know, just really loves Cam Newton. Yeah. Like, he is the man. He is still super <laughs> Cam and people still remember him, you know, for the good times, not the bad times. Yeah, I mean, people remembering him as Super Cam. I mean, you posted it on your – actually, you shared a post at least with me today. Uh, you know, one of the names, you know, not on the Patriots that did show up to Pat's West was, you know, projected number one pick to the Jacksonville Jaguars, Trevor Lawrence. He showed up apparently to, to go work on some stuff. And, every, and you know, you know, a good small portion of Pat's nation started to lose their minds because they saw him because they saw him at the same camp as Cam Newton and all these other Patriots. Uh, that, was a, that was actually crazy to see. I mean, obviously, that wouldn't – Trevor Lawrence, the Patriots, isn't even in our wildest dreams. I don't know what it would take to – I don't know what it would take for them to move yeah. up to that pick. There's have- a, there's, there's no chance there, but uh, Trevor Lawrence has always been a long-time, uh, you know, Pat – you know, not Pat's nation guy, but uh, he's always been a long-time Cam Newton fan, um, yeah. you know, growing up in that region. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, game respects game, and it kind of just, you know, shows, like, even if the players, you know, are not having the best season or not in their prime. Yeah. I mean, you know, so one of the other things, too, about the entire Pat's, Pat's West thing that's interesting to me, I mean, there's a couple things. Now, while it, it looks like these videos are coming out from Jared Stidham's people, I know that you said that this kind of, you know, looks like you, you at least said to me before that this looks like a chance for, you know, Cam Newton to really, you know, take some steps as a starting quarterback. And I agree with you. He has some chance to, he has some good chances to work with Hunter Henry and, and you know, some of these new guys and really get a chance to do some things. But I mean, this may just be the way that, you know, uh, Jarrett Stidham's PR people are putting stuff out because he's the one that's been posting a lot of these videos. Uh, but it looks like he's like really taking a command of the offense that, you know, maybe people weren't seeing before. He's like he, he was telling guys I, I, he was telling like a group of guys he's leading the chance. He, but he was also telling a group of guys, let's get all the newness out of the way. So that way we so that way when we go into training camp, we just hit the ground running. And that's yeah. something that really excites me as a Pats fan, because. You know, obviously with the COVID year last year, it was just very difficult to kind of see that. So to kind of see that, you know, Stidham is really engaging and really wants to, you know, fight for that job, you know, even knowing that Bill kind of maybe has some favoritism towards Cam, it really excites me about about him as a player. Yeah, I mean, Stidham's the type of guy that he's a hard worker. You know, you look at his college career, he was bounced around all over the place. He got yeah. caught up in, you know, like uh, a couple scandals. So he had to leave there due to the coaching staff. Then he went to uh, Oregon. Then I think he went from Oregon to um, Auburn. 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 Mm-hmm. Auburn. Yeah, he, went, he went to Auburn. You yeah. really look at his last year, you know, in Auburn. He really kind of excited the offense a lot more. They opened up the passing game. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Stidham, you know, still has a long way to go. And I have no idea what his ceiling is, Yeah, you know, honestly. But I'm really excited. And it's always good, you know, to learn under, like, someone, you know, who has won MVP, you know, regardless of where they are right now. Yeah, I agree with you there. And, I mean, you know, I don't know where Stidham's going to be physically anyways. I just think in terms of leadership, him taking these steps forward is definitely something good to see out of out of him because, I mean – I mean, I don't really know. I haven't really, you know, seen that those types of clips from him before. But just seeing that, I, I think it, you know, definitely shows kind of a, you know, a maturity from the guy. Yeah, I mean, you you've seen him. I don't know if you've been following, but you see him with, uh, uh, what's his name, Jason Palmer, uh, Carson uh, I, Palmer's uh, Carson, brother. The Carson oh. Palmer's brother. He's okay. a QB like guru type guy, and really? uh, he has a whole like uh, camp going and. Okay. Yeah, he, uh, yeah. He's been training with him. He's been training with uh, Trevor Lawrence. Been training with um, Justin Herbert and some of the other, you know, young QBs like Josh Allen. Mm-hmm. Uh, that I'm daily trains out with. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's really good to see it. And um, yeah, I mean, I think he's in good hands, and I think Pat's Nation, you know, can like rest assured that uh, you know we gotta trust in Bill, as they always say. <laughs> yeah. It's all going along smoothly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the final thing that really kind of does excite me from Pat's West, frankly, uh, you know, we obviously in free agency, the big, you know, the two, one of the two biggest moves that we made were the act were the signings of John New Smith and Hunter Henry Smith has yet to show up to this, you know, mini camp kind of situation. So I'd be interested to see what he does. But, you know, Hunter Henry is there. But, you know, uh, you know, as I mentioned, Devin Asiasi, the guy they drafted, la- one of the guys that they drafted last year and Matt Lacoste are there. So, you know, you know, while they did bring in these two tight ends to essentially be their replacements, seeing Devin Asiasi there, who I would think out of him or and him and Dalton Keene, which were the guys drafted last year, 
he probably has the most potential and kind of seeing his size, you know, you could, I, I think Hunter Henry could definitely, you know, be the blocking guy and could, you know, you know, be, be the red zone threat that he is. But I think, but I think, uh, you know, John U. Smith uh, definitely plays more of the Aaron Hernandez role in that offense, but you could honestly put, I think Devin Asiasi out wide and he could play like, you know, kind of like a big receiver, just kind of looking at it, you're just kind of looking at his size. That's how he kind of, at least physically in terms of his stature, that's kind of what he gives off to me. And I think, you know, having him there, maybe being able to work on some stuff, it could, you know, provide the Pats with a weapon that with a type of weapon that we don't even, that we didn't even know we had. Yeah. I mean, uh, his tape kind of coming out of UCLA says a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he was, uh, he's a big guy, you know? Yeah big blocker but he's also uh very very fast for his size and he also comes across me as very lean i don't know if that's the case yes. but he but he looks very lean yeah that's the big thing also he's very lean so mm-hmm. uh the one concern was is he a true tight end you know yeah and, and i he's think kind of a hybrid you've been seeing that... a lot of those you know ever yeah. since you know mm-hmm. the game really evolved but and i think and i think for his case right now that may not be a bad thing because they just brought in two not other guys all. if he could if he can be a hybrid guy and have him be the third guy and you know be more maybe be more of a just a big wide receiver that might play really well for him you know that could be yeah. something that you really want to look at going forward and you could have just an absolutely huge receiving court like and not and not in terms of just talent just in terms of physical size you know having De- Devin Asiasi as a wide receiver could play really well for us yeah I mean looking down the stretch uh I'm really interested to see what we do I mean the the two tight end offense you know always seems to go well in New England Mm-hmm. Uh, we had it back in the day with Brady uh, twice, mm-hmm. actually, um, on the first Super Bowl run and then uh, really on the end of the Super Bowl run on the second one, even with uh, the short stint after Hernandez with uh, Martellus Bennett. Yeah. And um, I mean, honestly, I'm really excited to see what we do, and especially uh, with the great signings I think we made this offseason. Yeah, me too. Now, kind of going back into general free agency, I know the draft is coming up and some stuff like that, but we've had some, you know, We've had some, you know, you know, pretty big, you know, free agency moves, you know, lately we've, we had Kenny Galladay going to New York. He's going to be a paid man there. Uh, you know, we've had James White. He's likely going back to the New England Patriots. And I, and, you know, I think it broke oh, today. Uh, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it became official, but it, but they said it was likely that he was going to go back there. I think it was uh, going to be like a one year deal. One year, the, 2.5. Yeah. Guaranteed. I think that's what it was going to be, which, you know, if, you know, maybe they can lock him up for more later on. I hope, I hope they can do that. But if maybe he starts to fall off, they, you know, maybe they get out early, but, and then, you know, I think, I think what broke today was T Y Hilton going back to the, going back to the Indianapolis Colts on a one yeah. $10 million deal, 8 million guaranteed. Uh, you were talking about, you were also talking to me about some possible deals, you know, in free agency that intrigued you outside of those three, were there any others that, you know, kind of really came across your mind? Um, just in general and free agency that has happened. Yeah. You had mentioned, you had mentioned some to me before the show. I, I was wondering if you kind of wanted to get into those. Oh yeah. Um, so, I mean, what's pretty bad for me is Lawrence guys back for the Pats four year deal. That's yeah. Huge for us. I mean, that's a crazy uh, commitment too to, to, you know, get that to, uh, to basically get that to a nose tackle guy. That's a crazy commitment, I think. Yeah, and he's a very commanding nose tackle as well and a mm-hmm. veteran for our, our defensive line, and that's a huge – and always good to, you know, bring back someone who knows what they're doing. Absolutely. Um, I'm really excited to see Kenny Galladay in New York, and you get to really, I think, see if Daniel Jones is the man, you know, especially with the signing of Kyle Rudolph, which I think is huge mm-hmm. for New York. They can run a yeah. double offense. And then uh, Sa- Saquon comes back healthy. They're looking pretty good. Yeah, the defense is really ramped up, and uh, you know, Joe Judge, um, very, very underrated coach. Uh, despite mm-hmm. you know the way they took off this year, he's literally the only coach who has coached, um, you know, under Nick Saban, and then he got yeah. directly hired to Bill Belichick, and then a head coach, which is crazy, honestly, one of the better, you know, if not the best, like you know, going <laughs> down like college coaches, NFL coaches, and then doing your own thing under yeah. the wing, both for like the past 10 years. You can't get any better than that. Like that's really that's... can't get any better. The guy has a phenomenal resume and I'm really yeah. excited to see what he does. Um, I'm really excited about the Jacksonville Jaguars really looking into it because mm-hmm. the amount of cap they have and everything still going on. Yeah. Um, and then as well, um, I'm really excited about, um, seeing how uh you know ty back to indy i think that's very very big Mm -hmm. um some people wrote off carson Wentz, you know really after this one bad season yeah degrees and everything and honestly uh here's a little hot take (laughs) um 
I honestly think that uh, Carson's going to be back and he's going to be, you know, above average QB, really bring okay. back you know, that Andrew Luck type vibes to uh, Indy. I really think he's going to excite, especially in that offense, because he's run a very similar offense. I mean, I hope so. He's he's had such a bad break. And I mean, if he can get back to that level, that'd be great. I would love it for him. And, you know, he's one of the type of guys that you really just got to root for. He was really like unfortunate situation. He was really doing everything he could. Mm-hmm. Um, and unfortunately, you know, it didn't really work out from him in Philly, but, um, best of luck to him. And it's huge, really huge signing TY even to a one-year deal. Yeah. Really uh, and then, and then, yeah. And finally in NFL news, uh, you know, uh, you know, now, uh, now Lions defenseman, former Rams, uh, defenseman, Michael Brockers, you know, after the, after the now, you know, record breaking, you know, Matthew Stafford for Jared Goff and some picks trade, uh, he came out, you know, in support of Matthew Stafford and basically said the trade for him said, said the trade for the Rams was a quote level up at the position. And, you know, basically only a couple of days later, he proceeds, you know, I mean, the trade had been, you know, basically finalized since, you know, like December or whatnot. And it had been in, you know, like basically, you know, recording all that stuff. But when it officially became, you know, official on the league, like at the start of the league year, and he tweeted out that it was a level up at the position. And then a couple of days later, he then gets shipped to Jared Goff's team up <laughs> to Jared Goff's new team at, and becomes a Detroit Lion. Uh, he's since come out and apologized for that. But I mean, that was just a, that's just a really bad look. Obviously, he's just trying to kind of, you know, support the new move and do all that stuff and, you know, hype up the team. But, you know, in terms of a, in terms of a bad series of events to kind of follow you that that's a really unfortunate series of events. Yeah. I mean, it was awful. I really, <laughs> I really feel bad, but you know, <laughs> he kind of did it to words, himself. His words. I mean, and he kind of did it to himself. Unfortunately, you can't, you can't get it. You, you just, uh, I don't know. Just watch what you say. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And uh, we'll come back to bite you. Yeah, the other offseason kind of crazy move is, uh, uh, I'd say, uh, you know, looking back, you know, the Las, the Las Vegas Raiders, they're signing, uh, def- despite, you know, pretty much releasing their entire offensive line, um, they really have been a little sneaky uh, picking up some skill players, you know, mm-hmm. Josh Smoke Brown, <laughs> uh, you know, speedy wide receiver from Buffalo. Kenyon Drake. Kenyon Drake, which is, uh, I think, a very interesting move, but also a very good move because he's mm-hmm. a very solid running back, too, behind Josh Jacobs. Yeah. A very different back than Josh Jacobs. So they kind of have the one, two like they did in Cleveland. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. yeah, and then they also um, – they just signed uh, – re-signed their center. So, I mean, at mm-hmm. least they have something to work for. But it's very, very interesting. And, you know, this offseason has been incredible – you know, and very, very wild to say the least of everyone mixing around, everyone going everywhere. And hey, you know, Marcus Mariota, he's still out there. So absolutely who knows if the Pats, who knows mm-hmm. at this point. Yeah. So that kind of covers what we have in NFL news. Now getting into, you know, I, this I think is the official first March Madness segment we've actually been able to do on Down the Wire because last year was canceled due to COVID. We've talked about, you know, little things here and there, you know, about getting into March Madness. But it has been upset central for, you know, these teams so far. I mean, I, I mean, frankly, I wish that Bryant, you know, had qualified for it instead of Mount St. Mary's. They would have been like a 14 seed and might have actually had a shot at a run. Really kind of makes me a little angry. But, you know, uh, but, you know, one team that's making the run of the that's making the run of a lifetime right now is 15 seed Oral Roberts. You know, they have they're in the sweet 16 right now. They are going absolutely crazy right now, uh, you know it's it's amazing to see i mean in a in a in a league of in a year of complete of you know i forget how many upsets they've there have been so far but you know i think within like the first day or you know maybe by the by maybe by the second night of the first round everyone's bracket was busted because of just how many you know unpredictable things there were i think after the oral roberts victory there were only 15 brackets left and it was absolutely i mean you know you can't you can't i mean just the fact that that no one was predicting that yeah no one, but apparently uh, one of my roommates at Mass Maritime was one of the eight people who had a perfect bracket. And then... Um, Did he just fill that out as, out as a joke? As a joke, completely oh joke. He had, uh, he had UConn going all the way. He picked like most of the upsets and he, randomized. And, and he became one of those 15 in, like, in all the world. <laughs> exactly. I mean, Oral Roberts has beat some legit competition to get there. I mean, they beat uh, number two Ohio State. 
which as a Michigan Florida. fan, I love. As a Michigan fan, I love that. But exactly. yeah. And as a Michigan fan, you do know that uh, Michigan is the only uh, Big Ten team left in the. Yes, we are. We are the only Big team, Ten team left. We are, you know, for once, Michigan in a sport is, you know, is the last Big Ten team standing. You know, yeah. hopefully we can actually make a run with it. I mean, I'm also a Villanova Wildcats fan, but so. You know, if those teams, if those two, if those two teams, you know, come to put, come, comes a push to shove, yeah. I'm going to have some, I'm going to, you know, have to, you know, res, you know, resolve some conflicts within myself, but uh, definitely really excited about that. Yeah. I mean, Villanova has uh, really surprised me, at least in this tournament, uh, very injury ridden coming in and they've really come kind of together and really pulled through. Mm-hmm. And yeah. the, uh, the most surprising one to me, at least is uh, really looking at it is, uh, you know, buddy you know for Syracuse he's really really impressing he dropped uh 30 points Jeez. and really out of nowhere I mean Syracuse and their uh, zone defense is really you know confusing you know players even though it's a very simple uh, defense really just you know proving that uh, you don't really need to be too complicated to uh, really make it work yeah. simple better sometimes yeah, the other team too that is making a that's making a run at, at it right now. I mean, well, you know, some of, some of us should be surprised. You know, I don't know why we are. Uh, Loyola Chicago is doing their thing yet again. They were the eight seed. They were the eight seed in their in their uh, you know in their bracket area coming into this part of the tournament, and they're back in the Sweet Sixteen. Sister Jean is doing her thing yet again. Uh, you know, the nineteen sixty three national champions are you know making their bid once again. And I can't believe it, you know, like they are just, they're, they're unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, they are very, very good and it is very crazy. And uh, it's all, and a lot of it is thanks to, uh, to that 40 year old janitor they have behind, behind the thing is like, that was kind of the phraseology you'd like to, that you kind of used with me before the show, uh, Cam, Cameron Crutwig, uh, he's been a force for them. <laughs> I mean, he is, you know, I mean, not only has he, has he become like a meme so far, you know, over the course of this tournament, but he's actually been a legitimate uh, help for the team. Yeah, it's very crazy, and their matchups are especially well. Oh, yeah. really just goes to show that uh, Loyola's coach is uh, actually very good, statistically speaking, and Mm -hmm. uh, they know what they're doing. And um, unfortunately, everyone else can't figure it out, but uh, Loyola is representing Chicago very well, I would say, and uh, really making uh, all the underdogs around the world very uh, proud. I'm really rooting for them. Yeah, were there any? I, I know you had mentioned uh, a couple other teams that you know were surprising you kind of going into this. What would I think you had mentioned Oregon State? Was there something you kind of wanted to highlight there? Yeah, I would say uh, that OSU. You know, mm-hmm. Oregon State. Um, they're really making a run. Cade Cunningham, he's yeah. uh, Oklahoma State, is uh, very, very, very good at basketball. As it's <laughs> and honestly, right now I have them uh, the hottest team right now in college basketball. Because it seems that even if you uh, you really don't think they're going to do well, they keep making it. And uh, as well as some other teams to look out for, uh, I would say Houston, you know, they're always there. They're always good. They just really can't make that big step up. And Arkansas right now is extremely hot as well. Yeah, I was seeing a lot of predictions that Houston's run would actually end here in the Sweet 16. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, how that matchup work, works out for them. Yeah, they're always, uh, you know, very competitive. They'll always beat a couple teams, but they never can seem, you know, to really get over that hump of the Sweet 16 or the Elite Eight. Not since the days of Hakeem Olajuwon. Not since those days. No. Uh, but, you know, uh, very interesting, you know, stuff going on with March Madness. Can't wait for the next rounds of that of that coming up. But uh, in but now going over to, you know, to, prof- to professional basketball in the NBA, uh, you know, the NBA trade, day, trade deadline is tomorrow at 3 p.m., Uh, There are some, there are some, you know, possible moves going around the league so far. One of them looks like it's going to be uh, magic is going to be magic's power forward, Aaron Gordon. Uh, He requested a trade after frustration with the, after frustration with management and just so many other things there. He, this season, he's currently averaging 14.6 points a game, 4.3 assists and 6.6 rebounds. Uh, You know, basically, you know, he's just like really fed up with them. You know, Gordon, you know, is a he's a really talented player i mean you know i i, you know, I, think, I think i think most you know I, I think most fans at this point think of think of him as the guy who's been robbed now as in two and two dunk contests and i think fairly so you know it's been it's been atrocious the way they that they that he's been treated i think he's only like still 25 26 years old because he came yeah. in the league at 19 and he's been and he, so he's still a very you know pretty young player 
And I think that, I think that he's got a, I think that if a, you know, contender could get him on, could get him on their team, he could be a really solid fit going down the school, going down the stretch. And it looks like the Celtics are on the run for him right now. I guess there are some conversations going on there. If, if anything broke during the show, we were going to get to it, but it doesn't look like there's anything official right now, but the Celtics are interested. So your thoughts. Um, I mean, he's a great player. Yeah. Very, very underrated. You know, as you say, most people look at him and they're like, who? Mm-hmm. And he's not a really a household name except for the dunk championship, which, uh, you know, me and you and a couple other guys in our like uh, age group, you know, that was like the prime time for us watching that. Uh, I would say incredible uh, competition there. Yeah. But, by, yeah by, now, by now, the dunk contest is dead. I mean, you have like the guys that you have in, in it now are atrocious. But like when we were going up seeing like Blake Griffin and seeing Dwight Howard do their thing, that was like a great time for watching dunk contests. Yeah. I mean, also in uh, NBA news, you could say is uh, Tyler Hero right now is shooting um, 31% from three. Jesus. And yeah, I mean, unfortunately for him, his shot really isn't uh, as good as it was in the bubble. And yeah. most people are really starting to look and think about it, you know, as well as Jamal Murray, you know, having uh, a little bit of an off year, you could say. Yeah. And uh, like the NBA bubble, does it really like, you know. Did it kind of inflate some stats? Yeah, you know, with uh, T.J. Warren and uh, some others, uh, you could say I mean, T.J. Warren was just a was just a was just a freak thing. I I feel like Tyler Hero, though, I thought really started to make a name for himself in in the bubble and you know kind of all, and kind of uh, influenced that Jack Harlow song, which everyone loved for when it came out. But uh, you know, I mean, you know, the the kid is still young. He's he has, he definitely has a, sh- a chance to work out his shot. Uh, but you know this. But this is definitely a test for him to see. You know, is he gonna, you know, have? Is he gonna become that star guy that a lot of people thought he was gonna become, or is he just gonna become the next version of a JJ Reddick, Kyle Korver guy that you know just kind of goes around the league and is just a three point specialist for the rest of the careers? He has a shot to you know become a star at that position, but he, but if you know this goes wrong, he could just turn back into you know just that guy. Yeah, I agree. And honestly, I'm really rooting for him. He seems like a good guy, good player, mm-hmm. and. Yeah. Um, yeah, very, very underrated uh, college player, mm-hmm. you know, very underwhelming for yeah. uh, the first couple, you know, big matchups, especially, you know, against Duke and uh, Zion and the whole team. But uh, yeah, other than that, I mean, Zion's making a very, very good run. He uh, He's recorded, I believe it was uh, 20 plus points in three games. Mm-hmm. He's one of the youngest to ever do that. Jeez. Pretty sure he beat out... Um, who was it? You beat out Luka Doncic for wow. uh, that that role. And uh, other than that, um, right now, I guess the biggest news you could say is Jalen Brown kind of complaining about, you know, the game plan that Brad Stevens is putting together as mm-hmm. he uh, he's a very good uh, shooter as uh, it's very well known, but um, all star this year as well. And he's just kind of a little complaining about uh, how with the game plan, the situation, it's more run through as Tatum as the star mm-hmm. of the yeah. offense. Um, rightfully so he's earned it and yeah. Jalen Brown's more taking a uh, backseat role I mean and, some people though could make the case for for Jalen I mean he is a I mean he's a very talented player to himself and he's taken I think you know very noticeable leaps every year while Tatum's had more of a gradual rise uh, gradual rise uh, to the top but you know um, you know I think both players present their case another thing I saw with Jalen Brown too is that uh, this was kind of just on Twitter but there was like a report coming out that that people were saying that someone had said, uh, I don't know, it was like some rumor thing. And it said, uh, and it said, uh, sources from inside the Celtics locker room say, say that uh, Tristan Thompson is that Tristan Thompson doesn't have to support amongst his peers. But Jalen Brown literally came out on Twitter today and, and just said cap and everyone just like immediately like that. Well. Yeah. 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 So, he came, that. yeah. so he came to their defense and that was great to see. Yeah. I mean, I love to see it also, but you know, Tristan, let's, let's pick it up a little bit. Yeah, and I think that's why getting Aaron Gordon here would be a good fit. I mean, you know, we do, we, do, we are in need of a power forward, a legit we, power forward. I mean, we've been in need of a. Frankly, I think we've been in need of a of a solid big man or just any you know real threat down down you know down you know in the front court. I mean, you know, obviously we had Al Horford, but he but he was still kind of a shooting guy. You know, we haven't really had a powerful guy down down uh, down in the front court really. I think since Kevin Garnett, <laughs> it's been yeah, crazy. Yeah, that is, and um. I mean, it is what it is, but yeah, yeah I mean, uh, the small ball little aspect that we're playing, and I think the Celtics are going to make moves to adjust, or I else so. we're just going to keep uh, teetering and, you know, really stay, I guess you could say Boston strong and really just stick with the roster we got. 
Yeah. I mean, we're eighth in the East right now, so I think we definitely need to make some moves, but, um, but, you know, in, you know, only a couple hours, we'll, we'll see where the Celtics are standing. Uh, We'll see where the Celtics are standing in terms of Aaron Gordon. Another player that could possibly, possibly be on their radar tomorrow uh, is uh, current Cavs forward, Andre Drummond. Uh, you know, when, when the whole news about Andre Drummond being sat came out, I think it was, you know, February 12th, it was the last time he played it. What was the last time he played a game? And it was like, it was like, he's sitting like it. And the Cavs said, we're going to sit Andre Drummond. So, so that way we can get a trade across. And then Draymond Green came out and had his comments basically saying that like there was a double standard going on. I, you know, I, I, I kind of had seen it, but I was able to also see, I was able to see it from the, from his perspective, but I was also at the time I was able to see it from management's perspective of like, of like, you know, even if it was going to be like a week or two weeks to kind of, you know, find a trade partner for, for them, I could understand it where it was like, where it was like, Hey, like we don't need this guy to get injured and then we can't trade him. So, you know, Hey man, we're going to sit, we're trying to, we're working through the final, you know, details of the trade. We're going to, we're going to sit you for the next couple of days while we, you know, get this thing out and he's going to be, and you're going to be sent out of town. That's kind of the way I thought the deal was going, you know, for the most part. So that's why I didn't really report on it initially. Cause I was like, I was like, you know, something's probably coming for him, but it's been well over a month at this point and he's still on the calves and still hasn't played a game at this point. And it's gotten ridiculous. So you know, tomorrow we're going to see, is he going to, you know, be bought out by the team or is he, you know, or will he be, or will he be dealt somewhere else? I mean, he, I think he was averaging like 17 points a game this year. So yeah, you know, he, he could still be a good threat for, you know, any team that needs a big man, the Lakers are interested. The nets, I guess, have some interest. Frankly, I think the Celtics should, should also throw their, should also throw their, uh, their hat in the ring. I mean, I think that we need any big, any big support that we could get would be a huge addition for us. Yeah, exactly. And especially facing the 76ers, mm-hmm. um, it's really hard to compete with Joel Embiid. He is the best center in the league. Mm-hmm. And um, honestly, he's probably a front runner right now for MVP with yeah. LeBron out. Yeah, you know, I, was about to say, I, I was about to say on my last episode, I had said that LeBron was probably going to be in the running for MVP, but with him out indefinitely, uh, Embiid, Embiid realized a chance to make his, uh, realized a chance to, you know, make his mark and prove his case. Yeah, and also um, a very underrated thing was uh, Dennis Schroeder kind of coming out and saying, like, we're still playing with that same aggressiveness. Like, everyone's still coming for us. We're yeah. still playing any champs, and we got to play like that every night. Mm-hmm. Can't really mix it up. But, yeah. unfortunately, when you have uh, Kyle Kuzma, really, as your, uh, your only as, hope. As the guy. <laughs> The man, it's the uh, man. I remember when I remember when people said that Kyle Kuzma, when when people were like, "I'd take Kuzma over Tatum," and I was like, and I, and I was like, "Wow." Yeah, very power move by the Celtics moving back to get their man, Jason Tatum. <laughs> yeah, uh, but you know that that's kind of that that's kind of that whole situation there. Uh, you know, it's gonna be a very interesting trade deadline. We'll probably try to if there's any huge moves, we'll you know cover that on Friday's show. Uh, but before we do go down the wire, there is uh, one huge event. You know, there will there is some UFC events coming up. You know, later on this week, and I'll cover that some more on Friday's show. But uh, in terms of boxing, you know, we saw it last November where Mike Tyson, at, years after you know stepping out of the ring, I think in 2005, he came back in 2020, 15 years later, and fought against Roy Jones Jr. The, it ended in a tie, and you know it was it, you know for for an ending. I mean, Tyson Tyson actually really killed him in, in that ring. I mean, he was just landing there was like one body blow where you know he really kind of leveled jones and it was bad but it looks but you know now i guess tyson has his next has the next fight on his uh on his radar it initially looked like there was initial reports that he turned this fight down uh for, for a 25 million dollar fight but it is now reported that uh on memorial day weekend he is going to he's going to be fighting a vander holyfield you know the man uh holyfield i think is 58 years old tyson i think is 56 so these guys are going to be are going to be getting in the ring at my at Hard Rock Stadium in Miami Gardens, Florida, in front of a I don't know what the I don't know what the COVID limits will be at this point, but it's going to be during it's going to be in, I think two months I think you know restrictions are going to ease up a little more. You're going to have a you know fairly you know packed stadium full of full of fans cheering this guy on. It's going to be quite the event to see, especially because especially you know just because of their age and all this stuff. Uh, what do you think about this? What do you think about this fight going down? Uh, honestly, I'm kind of over the whole. Uh... I still got it type boxing. Yeah. And um, I mean, it's very cool and it's very nice. And you can always see, you know, I saw Tyson fight and I saw Roy Jones Jr. fight. And Holy both Field fighters, and stuff. Both fighters, all, all the fighters are very, very well respected, well accomplished fighters in the game. Um, but, you know, when you look at that and you look at their body, you're looking you're, at it. You're, 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 yeah. you're probably just you're like they're old. The health risk at this point. And honestly, you know, it's them at the end of the day with the passion and fight to keep going, keep going. But 
there hits a limit and there hits an age. Yeah. Um, for everyone not named Tom Brady, to you now really <laughs> step away and just like relax and yeah. take a breather from the game. Yeah, Tyson. I mean, I know he said he felt like he was in really good shape. I mean, you could obviously tell it wasn't the same guy. You know, if you had to determine the winner of that draw, it was Mike Tyson. He did really yeah. kind of. He did put it on Roy Jones Jr. He jo- Mike Jones. Tyson at this point is an average fighter. Well, Mike Tyson, you know, in his prime was untouchable. Yeah, exactly. You know that you, you kind of took the words right out of my mouth. So. Uh, but he's fighting a Vander Holyfield, you know, uh, you know, obviously Holyfield beat him the first time and the second time it was disqualified because he tried to bite his ear off and he actually did bite it, part of his ear off. So uh, mm-hmm. I don't, this will be this will be the third rematch, you know, however many years later at this point, basically almost like two decades later that they're going to be going at it. Uh, going to be a very interesting matchup. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, they're, you know, almost 60 year old guys at this point. So just to see them get in the ring and do this, it's. It, it, you're right. It is a health kind of a, hazard. Kind of a feat on its own, but also you kind of look at it and it is a health hazard. But the other thing too that you can look at is, I mean, you look at that initial fight, and I'm definitely gonna be more excited to have to see like a full stadium of people cheering this on. Maybe that you know, you know, really get something out of these guys, and you know, maybe they th- maybe they're really throwing some haymakers that you know they weren't in that you know Tyson wasn't throwing in that other fight. And you know, the other thing that could be exciting too is that you know maybe you get Snoop Dogg back on the call doing that kind of a doing that kind of you know you know commentary which we which was awesome during the initial fight and you know maybe you get some awesome pre-fights too like some celebrity fights like obviously you had the jake paul fight before where, where he just knocked nate robinson clean out so maybe yeah. you get some maybe you get some fun fights like that maybe you actually get some legitimate fights in there where you have some really yeah, good boxers make it more of a show yeah i, I understand yeah. that and uh so you honestly, know, so tyson holyfield could be the main event but you know when but people did look and said probably the jake paul fight was probably the was probably the headlining event you know, get some celebrity fights in there, maybe get even some legitimate fights in there. I don't know what it would take, but, you know, and, you know, it said that he's fighting on, on Memorial Day weekend, but it didn't say that he, I actually, it's, he's probably the headliner. I'm just, but I'm just speculating, you know, who knows, but just to have that as a possible option is really exciting to me. I can't wait to see this fight. I mean, you know, you know, you know, it's just going to be something fun to watch. It's Memorial Day weekend, going to be having a cookout and, you know, get to watch, get to watch a Tyson fight in Miami. What could be better? Exactly. So so I'm really excited to see that, but I'm afraid it is officially time to say that we are down to the wire, which means we're going to go through everything we talked about in the past hour. And we're going to let you guys, uh, we're going to let you guys enjoy the rest of your night. So we started things off, uh, you know, obviously welcoming, welcoming John into the show, John, obviously, you know, thank you so much for being here, man. I really appreciate it. No, I appreciate you. Thank you for letting me uh, get another opportunity on the show. I believe this is uh, my third time on. It's, and it's been way too far in between. We hope to get you back on much sooner. So I'm very glad you're yeah, It's always talk. a pleasure, you know, joining, coming on down to the wire and really just uh, talking sports. Yeah, you know? I appreciate so it. Just like me and Brian were, you know, a couple and still do, you know, in his basement. So yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, that's, that's the way, that's the way this kind of stuff starts. And I'm glad to have you on, man. Uh, but then we kind of, but from there, we talked, we talked about your story about our, our you know, kind of your story with an interaction of a flag football coach this past weekend, really crazy stuff there going on there. Uh, we proceed after that, we went into talking about uh, the Patriots, you know, kind of little mini training camp called Pats West out in Irvine, California with some of the, with a bunch of uh, past players, old and new showing up. We talked about some free agency and trade and trade discussions kind of buzzing around the NFL, including guys like Galladay back to New York, T.Y. Hilton back to Indy, and James White to the New England Patriots. We talked about uh, Lions defensive lineman Michael Brockers apologizing to quarterback Jared Goff after he after he basically called him out after after the Matthew Stafford trade. Uh, in March Madness news, we talked about the we talked about Oral Roberts making the run of making the run of their lifetime, as well as Loyola Chicago, uh, you know, making another run into the Sweet 16. You know. Sister Jean again is working her magic yet again. You know, I don't know what I don't know what, what type of prayer she's sending up there to the big man, but you know, but you know, it's working. She's sending statistics up to the big <laughs> man. His uh, absolutely in that prayer. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then in NB- and then in NBA news, we talked about Aaron Gordon requesting a trade from the Magic. Uh, he's frustrated. I guess frustration kind of fueled the move. The Celtics are interested in him. They're currently eighth in the East. We talked about the we talked about uh, you know the possibilities for ever Andre Drummond. You know ahead of the NBA trade deadline that is tomorrow, and we finished things off talking about Mike Tyson. You know fighting again at fighting again in his fifties against Evander Holyfield this Memorial Day weekend. Uh, it, it came out basically less than twenty four hours after everything happened. Uh, you know 
this was a great show tonight. I'm very thankful. We'll be back again on Friday. But if you guys don't follow us yet, we I actually found out very recently. We're now on Google Podcasts as well. Uh, but you know, for anyone who doesn't follow us, you can follow us on Spotify, YouTube, uh, and you know, the main hub that we kind of post all our all of our kind of things, you know, from is our Instagram. You can follow us on Instagram at down dot to the wire. Again, at down dot to the wire. There's a link tree in there that should link to all our other podcasts. Uh, but thank you guys so much for joining in. We'll be back on Friday. And from down to the wire, I'm Brian Costa. And I'm John Warren. Thank and you. Ha- and have a great weekend, you guys. We'll talk to you next time.